If you're a Texas landowner and you're interested in improving the quality of the genetics on your ranch, you can contact me at DeerAndWildlifeStories.com. Deer farming is a topic that, well, when it's brought up among some deer hunters, is an immediate turnoff, and that's always amazed me. I would think that any deer hunter would find it fascinating to learn more about whitetail deer, and there is literally no better person in the world to learn about whitetails than from a deer farmer. Why, you may ask? Well, deer farmers, at least the deer farmers that I know, were deer hunters before they became deer farmers. And they became deer farmers because their love of the deer. Being a deer farmer is more than just a job. It's honestly, it's a lifestyle, and it happens to be a lifestyle that fits well for many of us. And if you've ever visited a deer farm, I think you'd be impressed with what goes on. And you might just find out that this deer farming way of life would be right for you. Hi everybody, welcome to the show and to Florida. We're on today's program. We'll introduce you to the folks with the Southeast Trophy Deer Association. And we'll tell you how they're working to help fund critically important research that is being conducted on Florida deer farms. And it's overseen by the University of Florida and this research will help all deer farmers around the country. And at the same time, every deer hunter in North America should be grateful for the investment in research being done right here in the Sunshine State. As a deer hunter, I wanna know all I can about America's favorite big game animal. That's why I became a deer farmer. Without deer farms, we lose our greatest resource for research and whitetail management. With them, we gain more knowledge than ever before. Join me as we discover the truth about whitetails and meet those who work every day to preserve this great species for future generations. My name is Keith Warren, and this is Deer and Wildlife Stories. I'm Samantha Wisely. I'm a professor of wildlife sciences at the University of Florida. My specialty is wildlife diseases, and in particular, I study diseases of deer. So I'm the director of the Cervidae Health Research Initiative. We call it CHERRY for short. And this is a program that's a university and industry partnership to help make the deer industry in Florida both profitable, but also environmentally sustainable. So the way our diagnostic service works is that we actually have a deer hotline and uh, farmers have this number, they call it up when they have a sick or a dead deer. Cherry Deer Phone, this is Hannah. Hey Hannah, this is uh, Brandon Parker. Uh, I'm a deer farm manager over at Deers of Our Lives. I just found a dead buck fawn this morning. Uh, I heard you guys uh, would come out and do some testing possibly. Yes, of course. I'm so sorry to hear that, but we c I can come out later this afternoon if you text me your address and I will text you my estimated arrival time. All right, perfect. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, if any uh, deer exhibits symptoms of being sick or if they've obviously died of a disease rather than simply running into a fence, um, we will run out to their farm we send a necropsy technician who's under the supervision of our wildlife extension veterinarian. Hello? Hi, Brandon. This is Hannah Barber with UF. I am right outside your gate. All right. Should be open. Uh, just pull up on the driveway and then come up to the side door of the house and I'll be waiting for you. All right. See you in a bit. All right. See you. Bye. I'm glad to see you. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Come on inside, we'll talk in the AC. So tell me a little bit about what's going on with this fawn. So it all started a week ago. Um, 
completely normal. I went out there, fed him some cookies, he was fine. And then three days later, I saw some swelling around his neck and his jaw. And I hit him with a round of Draxin, and I was just gonna keep my eye on him. And I go out there about two days later, and um, he's still swelled. He's not really with the herd anymore. He's not coming up to the fence when I have cookies for him. Okay, did you follow up with any other treatment, just the one-time Draxin or multiple dosages? I hit her with the Draxin again two days after that just because she was really weak, stumbling around a little bit, wasn't really keeping up with her at all, wasn't coming up to the fence when I went to go see him, which is really abnormal for her. Do you have any other fawns exhibiting similar symptoms or just this one? No, so far I used the only one, but I really want to nip this in the butt now because I don't want anything spreading. Of course. So we'll go take a look at her and see what's going on. And they will perform a necropsy on the farm um, for us, collect all sorts of tissues to understand why that animal died. They'll then run those tissues back to the University of Florida campus, and then so begins the diagnostic process. We have seven different labs to which we send our samples to get a really comprehensive understanding of why that animal died. Um, so looking at these two flat lines, I can see that this animal did not die from either blue tongue or EHD. So the importance of the research that we do with deer farmers is that we are able to identify the disease agents that in, in these farm deers, and with that, we increase our knowledge of which of these bacterial or virus are very important and that information can be extrapolated for the wild deer population also here in Florida. So what did the necropsy reveal? Well, two things. One good thing is that it was an EHD. So no EHD in your farm. You can be you can rest aside okay. about that. We do believe we saw signs that it could be a lung infection. So we're looking into that to find out exactly what bacteria was involved, but it's really good that it was an EHD. Oh yeah, that's great it was an EHDV. I'm really glad to hear that. I, even better is just the fact that, you know, at least we have some idea of what's going on with them. It's really important that I know what's happening with the deer out there. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome, you're welcome. Yeah. We're here to help you. The Deer Farming Channel is brought to you in part by Record Rack Deer and Elk Feeds. Viewer feedback is presented by Protect the Harvest, Protect the Hunt. All right, this is off of Facebook from a viewer by the name of Jack. He says, while I see that CWD needs to be monitored, what I don't understand is the response plans to this disease are so different from state to state. Why is this so? Good question. CWD has been here in Wyoming for over 50 years, and all they're doing is monitoring it. No mass killings, no mass hysteria, no scaring the public. Why can't other states learn from us? Oh, oh, Jackie, I don't know why. You would think that other states would uh, want to learn from somebody else's mistakes. I always told my kids it's better to learn from somebody else's mistakes rather than making those mistakes yourself. And so as we have all these states with all these different response plans to CWD, I think it's time to step back a little bit and say, wait a minute, we need to learn from states that had this a long time before. And Wyoming, with over 50 years of CWD history, I think they may have it right. The research that we do here in Florida in the deer industry is helpful for all of the deer industry throughout the United States. We study one of the most devastating diseases to the deer industry, epizootic hemorrhagic disease. So epizootic hemorrhagic disease is also called EHD, and we shouldn't confuse it with chronic wasting disease, which is CWD. They're very, very different diseases. So there's big differences between EHD and CWD. CWD is a recently emerged prion disease that um, wildlife agencies are very, very worried about. Um, oftentimes it can lead to the culling of herds, depending upon the regulations of each state. We think of EHD as, particularly in the South, as, as, as an endemic disease. It's something that's been here for millennia but it is also something that native deer have dealt with for a long time. Now deer can die very quickly of EHD or deer can die very slowly of EHD, but it's typically not regulated by state agencies. 
So EHD is a viral disease and it's carried by insects and those insects are noceums. And these bite a deer. If the deer has epizootic hemorrhagic disease or EHD, it picks up that virus and then it transmits it to another deer. And that's how the virus moves from deer to deer via these little biting midges. So my role in Cherry is to help figure out which species of noceum or biting midge is transmitting EHD virus to Florida deer and then help figure out a way to try and control that midge species and the other midges which are affecting deer in Florida. The way we figure out which midge species is transmitting EHD virus is going out into the field to deer farms to sampling lots and lots of midges through trapping and then we look at different things that the midges do. So if we can figure out which midge species are biting the deer, which species are infected with the virus in nature, then we can figure out which ones are actually transmitting the virus. Then, if we know about where that midge species is breeding, we can target control efforts to try and reduce the populations of that midge below a threshold that's going to support EHD virus. So what we have here is a CDC light trap, and we're looking for EHD. And this is a great place to look for EHD because there's standing water with muddy areas around it. Um, there's lots of shade, and there are host animals for the adult midges to feed upon. And so here, the CDC light trap um, has a UV LED light attached to it. And we also have a um, thermos full of dry ice, which gives off carbon dioxide, which the midges are also attracted to. And so once the midges are attracted to this area, they go fly up towards the light and are sucked in through the fan that's in here, powered by a six volt LED, um, battery. And so once the midges are, and other insects are in this bag, they're filtered through and they end up in the bottom of this tube filled with ethanol and we can cap it and take it back to the lab for identification. If you're in Texas and interested in becoming a deer farmer, you can contact me for deer farming franchise opportunities right here in Texas at deerandwildlifestories.com. So EHD is an important issue for wildlife. Um, we see lots of different deer that are affected by it, mule deer, white-tailed deer, occasionally elk are affected by it. And so it's something that we need to learn more about. It, in some ways it's a very mysterious disease. People have studied it for a long time, but we're just now starting to understand things about the pathogen that will make things like vaccines become a reality for deer farmers. The Wildlife and Aquatic Animal Disease Laboratory is involved with the Cherry Partnership and we are lucky enough to actually be working at a university where we're working not only with deer farmers but also allowed to do research. The research focus is on a virus and series of viruses that is impacting deer across North America, but a very big problem in Florida especially. And the ultimate goal of our research is to define the viruses that are a problem so that we can generate a vaccine to protect farm deer and of course wild deer across the state and across the country. Through our research, the research that we're doing, we have access to data that in other ways is very difficult. Then that data gives us the ability to identify the main bacteria that cause disease in white-tailed deer. It gives us the ability to identify viruses that are circulating. And one of the main things is that all that information also allows us to be able to extrapolate that for wild deer. What I'm really hoping for in this show is that people with other deer associations around the country will wake up and realize that the little deer association down here in Florida, the Southeast Trophy Deer Association, which is much smaller than a lot of these associations, is very proactive. And they have done something that other states haven't done. They're working with some really, really smart people. And these really smart people are gonna be able to get research that's gonna be able to tell us a whole lot more about the white-tailed deer. 
I think that decisions on managing for white-tailed deer, whether they're wild deer or whether they're captive deer, need to be based upon science and not somebody's political agenda and some rhetoric, but based upon science. And as people like the Southeast Trophy Deer Association that are working together with the CHERRY program that are getting science, they're getting good, hard science. And it's that science that's gonna be able to help not just deer farmers down the road, but deer hunters and landowners that have white-tailed deer on it all over the nation. The Deer Farming Channel is brought to you in part by New Dart, leading the industry in accuracy. The Southeast Trophy Deer Association is made up of uh, white-tailed deer breeders and farmers in the state of Florida. And uh, these guys, I'm gonna tell you something, if you don't think Florida's got some big deer, you need to come down here and take a look. I mean, we're gonna roll a few clips here and show you. I mean, Florida has got some monster white-tailed deer and all these deer live on places that are owned by the members of the Southeast Trophy Deer Association. So what is the Southeast Trophy Deer Association doing for the deer industry nationwide? Plenty. The reason why is that the research, the information that they obtain down here in Florida is being shared with associations from Michigan to Texas to every place in between. And so it's all this information that we're able to obtain from some really smart people with some very expensive research that's helping us to create healthier deer herds and healthier deer herds. And all this information is gonna be able to help us be able to help people that have wild deer on their places too. My name is Lori Cook. I'm serving as president of Southeast Trophy Deer Association here in Florida. I'm also a veterinarian and a surveyed consultant in the state. Today we've all gathered to get together to celebrate our annual summer picnic and meeting, but we've invited some special guests um, to be part of this event. University of Florida Cherry Program has been instrumental working with us deer farmers and preserve owners in the state, helping us with some of the challenges we've been facing over the last three years. And we also are blessed to have Mr. Keith Warren from Deer and Wildlife Stories to kind of help um, get this message out across the nation about what's going on here in Florida. Deer farming is big business in Florida. The only way to get this research done is through deer farming. As most people wondering, where's the funding come for all this research? It's through our legislation here in Florida. We have talked to our politicians, both local and on a state level, and received this funding through our legislation. In addition, the Southeastern Trophy Deer Association is also helping fund this project through our annual picnics, our annual charity auctions, and our donations back to the CHERRY program. The relation that the CHERRY program has with the Southeastern Deer Association, it's very, very important. Without them and without their support, this project will, will just be impossible. We're very thankful that uh, farmers uh, open up and they give us information and they allow us to come to their farms. The CHERRY program is a wonderful partnership, not only between the university where the research happens, but also our deer farmers that are raising our deer for stocking purposes. The importance of this partnership is that we are doing the research on the development of vaccines and tools to be able to make the diagnosis for the problems on the farm. And of course, we're working in Florida, but this extends across the country for all those that actually enjoy white-tailed deer in the wild, on the farm, or otherwise. What the message that the Southeast Trophy Deer Association would like to get out to the nation is, we all care, we care about these animals. We would love to encourage every state to get a program like this started to help you all producers in your state as well to improve your management skills because we, there's so much we don't know uh, as far as the deer world. So if you have any questions regarding how we can maybe help out with implementing a program like this in your state, please don't hesitate to call any board member from the Southeast Trophy Deer Association. You wind up looking at our show and most of the time you see men, you see guys on the show, I mean, because hey, farmers are guys, but you know what, there's farmer girls. And what guy doesn't love a farmer girl? I'll tell you what, the, when you come down here to Florida, the president of the Southeast Trophy Deer Association is a girl, okay? Dr. Lori Cook. And uh, she is as knowledgeable and as passionate about the white-tailed deer as I am or anybody else that's in the deer farming industry. And then you've got Dr. Samantha Wisely, Dr. Sam they call her. That woman is worth her weight in gold times a thousand. Her passion 
and her knowledge and her leadership to oversee this cherry program should be valued by every deer farmer and every deer lover around the country. And so I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about what's going on with the cherry program, that's a servant health research initiative right here in the state of Florida. Get a hold of the folks with the Southeast Trophy Deer Association. You can find them online, and I think you're going to be very, very impressed. My name is Keith Warren, and you've been watching Deer and Wildlife Stories, and I'd like to say thanks.